Good afternoon, and my name is Kent Mormon, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog-TAC. I call to order the May 24th, 2021 uh, Dr. Cog-TAC meeting. Dr. Cog has officially switched to a digital platform, uh, Zoom, and uh, you will notice the layout may be slightly different than what we've had in the past. Members and alternates, you are now have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. With this new platform, even though we are now able to use cameras, we still ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak to an agenda item, question, or comments. Please make sure that you typed your name reflects your first name and last name in who you represent. If you have a account that is um, through your institution that you're representing, uh, please make sure it's name, your name is reflected, your first and last name is reflected along with your representation on that. Uh, if you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to agenda items. At this time, I'd ask Cam to uh, do a real roll call of the members and alternates. Um, and if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. From the uh, participants list, uh, those that are uh, will be recorded um, that are not members or alternates. Cam, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for members and alternates, I currently see uh, Ron Papsdorf, Deborah Basket, Kent Mormon, Aaron Busto, Art Griffith, Brooke Svoboda, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, uh, Chris Chauvin, Chris Montoya, David Ulane, Deborah uh, Basket, uh, Eugene Howard, George Hollenkoff, Jeff uh, Dakenbring, Jessica Micklebust, uh, Jim Eusen, Jordan Rudel, Kelly Heaton, Ken Johnson, Christine Kenyon, uh, Mac Callison, uh, Maria De Andre, Megan Davis, Paul Josidis, Phil Greenwald, Sarah Grant, St Stephen uh, Strominger, Steve Durian, and that was all of the members and alternates I saw at that moment, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, at this time, um, we'll uh, look at the um, go to public comment. Um, if you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. And when we call on you by the last digits of your phone number, um, you can speak. Staff will unmute you and then you will uh, need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have uh, three minutes to speak after which you will be asked to wrap up your comments and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each item. So if you do have a public comment, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands raised, uh, we'll close public comment at this time. And we'll move on to uh, the April 26, 2021 TAC meeting summary. Uh, if the members are all in it, have any, uh, is there any discussion or corrections or questions about that summary? If so, please raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. Seeing no hands raised, uh, the minutes stand approved as submitted. At this time, we'll move into the action items. And our first action item is the fiscal year 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program 
amendments and it's attachment B and Todd Cottrell, I believe is going to present this, Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if we have three amendments to the 22 to 25 tip for your consideration this afternoon. Uh, the first is an amendment to the region, CDOT region one faster pool, uh, where the request is to add 33 new pool projects and remove seven, uh, basically covering years, federal fiscal year state, federal fiscal years 24 and 25. Uh, this totals $60 million. Uh, both the second and the third amendments are connected. Um, these amendments will add $6.1 million for a phase two of the I-70 noise wall project. The amendment covers, uh, the amendment covers placing the funding into the I-70 noise wall project, in addition to adding it to the region one RPP pool for additional tracking purposes. Um, so happy to take any comments or questions you may have on the amendments before you. Uh, if not, the motion is to recommend to the RTC the amendments to the 22 to 25 tip. Are there any questions uh, for Todd? If you please raise your hand. If there's no questions or comments, uh, I'd entertain a motion. Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached amendments to the FY 2022 through 2025 Transportation Improvement Program um, recommendations. Thank this you. Is Frank Thank Bruno, you, I second that. Who was that? Frank Bruno, uh, I second. Okay, thank you, Frank. Art, did you have any additional comment? I saw your hand up. I just was going to second the motion, so we're covered. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional discussion? Please raise your hand. I think Brian and did you have any additional? No, okay. Uh, with that, we have a motion in a second. All those in, uh, in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. That concludes our action items uh, for today. We'll now move into the informational briefings and there's several of them. And our first one will be on the transportation demand management for fiscal years 22 to 23, um, the eligibility requirements. And I believe Steve Erickson has that one, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the, the committee. Let me see if I can share my screen here. See if we can get this in presentation mode as well. Are you able to see that now? No, we're still seeing the, uh, not seeing your presentation yet. All right, well, let me look at that again. You probably all experienced this. I've had a uh, I had a slow computer today, so it, it's up now. Okay, and I'm I'm gonna get here. I hope in the presentation mode. So, but anyways, thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, here today to talk about uh, our TDM set aside uh, uh, transportation demand management set aside for fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Still trying to get this to show full screen. Okay, I think we're good maybe. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so just to put this into context, uh, this particular TDM set aside is, is part of TDM services. So in the 2020 to 2023 uh, set aside programs, there's roughly $13.4 million uh, set aside um, for various programs. Uh, 8.8 .8 million of that is for the Dr. Cog Way to Go program. In addition, we fund $2.8 million uh, that go to the seven regional TMA partners uh, at $100,000 per year. And there is uh, $1.8 billion for TDM non-infrastructure projects. And that's what we're here to talk about uh, today. So this is the, 
the second cycle of, of this particular set aside. So the purpose for these projects is, is to support marketing, outreach, and research projects that reduce single occupant vehicle travel. So really these projects should, should be very complementary to uh, the Way to Go program and partnership at Dr. Cog. So we're looking to reduce traffic congestion, improve our air quality, uh, always looking to pilot new approaches to TDM to, you know, to find approaches that, that might work that we can replicate across the region. Uh, always interested in supporting healthy and active choices and generally improving awareness and access to mobility options for people of all incomes, uh, ages and abilities. So the funding that's available for this two year cycle is $900,000. Uh, to be eligible, a project sponsor uh, has to um, be able to receive or eligible to receive uh, directly uh, federal transportation funds. Uh, project sponsors must be in good standing with the state of Colorado and all of the scopes of work uh, here must adhere to STBG program guidance. Um, and there is a, a local match on this, either cash or in kind of 17%. Uh, so this is a two-step application process, and this will probably look pretty familiar, I think, to uh, some of what we're doing with the CMPI uh, grants, as well as what, what we did this last go-round on, on this. So it starts with a letter of intent, followed by an application, so sort of that two-step process. If you drill down a little bit into this, um, uh, here's, here's what we'll ask of folks is that they, first of all, attend a mandatory TDM service application workshop. Uh, from there, we would hope that they would identify a project concept and if, if necessary or, or desired, begin early discussions with Dr. Cog staff about what that potential project might be. It's at that point that we would ask them to submit a letter of intent which we would review and, and then have discussions uh, on. And then applicants that, that are deemed to be a good fit for this would be invited to apply uh, for these grant opportunities. They would then submit the formal application and we would uh, then begin the review process. And I'll get into a little more detail on that, but we'll be standing up a, uh, a review panel uh, that will meet uh, a number of times to kind of go through and score and, and select those projects. Uh, once those projects are selected for recommendation, we'll come back before uh, these committees and our Dr. Cog Board of direct, uh, Directors for ultimate uh, approval on that. And then of course applicants are notified and we begin the uh, uh, contracting process, which uh, is actually done through uh, CDOT. So the review process, again, I mentioned standing up a, a review panel, that'll be comprised of both internal Dr. Cog uh, folks, as well as some external stakeholders. Uh, typically, we've had some folks from my division from communications and marketing, uh, wherein we oversee the way to go program, but we'll invite uh, folks from uh, transportation planning and operations, regional planning and development, and potentially area agency on, on aging. Uh, to that hey, Danny. Hey, Art. Oh. How's it going? Good. So, I'm sorry. Danny, I guess I'm. I saw your bad. email. Hey, Art. Art and Danny, we're getting background noise. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I'll continue. I, I just uh, I thought there might have been a question. So, uh, so externally, we we've, we've typically had folks from Federal Highways, Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, CDPHE, as well as other TDM uh, professionals in the region. So we've, we've had representation from Regional Air Quality Council, uh, RTD, uh, occasionally some other TDM professionals. So each uh, member of the review panel will review uh, those applications and score them and, and score them based on what you see in section A of the attachment, which was this evaluation criteria. In addition to the review committee scoring, um, Dr. Cog staff will score on, on some elements that are more uh, data-driven, uh, things like um, uh, inclusion in, in short trip opportunity zones, uh, whether or not they're a part of uh, uh, an environmental justice area, uh, and um, you know, other things that, that really are more data-driven. If, if I'll back up a step and just talk a little bit about the um, 
you know, the, the things that the review panel scores, those are obviously heavily focused if, if you review what's in section A on uh, reduction of, of VMT and project innovativeness, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, two elements to that scoring, and then the panel convenes sort of reviews and discusses uh, the application scoring uh, by, by each review panelist and ultimately comes up with a list of recommended projects, again, brought back before uh, these committees and Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Uh, basically, the, you know, the, the weighting on this is that that review panel scoring uh, ends up being about 75% of the total and that data-driven scoring by Dr. Cog staff uh, at roughly 25%, and then again, sort of a listing of the, uh, uh, of the elements of each. And that's really it. Uh, with, with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions or, or comments related to this. I, I think the process here will be, I'll be back before you uh, this next month, and, and hopefully this will be an action item at that time. Just to remind uh, the members and alderans to raise your hand if you have questions or comments. And first up, we have uh, Deborah Basket. Deborah. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I um, actually have a question. I think it's on the second slide where you laid out the general categories of where the funding from this um, set aside goes to. Let's see, the one that talks about how much goes to TMOs. There we are, thank you. So I am just curious in the second box there, TDM services, where we um, allocate $100,000 per year to the seven TMAs, TMOs. I was wondering when the last time that was increased. Oh my goodness, it's a, a very good question, Deborah. I think it's been uh, perhaps two years ago, at the most, maybe four years ago, we, okay. we increased it from 80,000 to 100,000. Yeah, probably would have been actually at the beginning of, of, of this TIP process, the 2020 TIP process. So ahead of okay. that. Okay, so that's, yeah. I should be thinking about that for the next general TIP cycle. Two years isn't that long, but I, right. I just wanted to check in. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Phil Greenwald, you're next. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, uh, Steve, for presenting. Uh, and I did not see the evaluation criteria. Um, I must, I might have missed that, but it's on page three of your larger document that's attached and TDM services set aside. Just wanted to ask the question basically from one of our, um, one of the TAC members who could not be here from Boulder County today from uh, Alex Hydright. Had the question of the level of innovation and uniqueness in that, in that evaluation criteria. And just the idea that, you know, some, some ideas are good and they certainly do a lot of work to, uh, to, to move us forward, but do they have to be innovative and unique every time or can we fall back on some tried and true uh, criteria? So uh, that was one of the comments that, uh, that he was making and I just wanted to pass that along that, um, you know, we have that. And then the next one on your, on your chart is re replicability. So we're kind of saying, do something new and innovative and get points for it. And then do something that's replicable so somebody can use it again next time or later. And so it's an interesting conundrum of, um, of those two pieces. So I just wanted to just add that into the record. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Phil. And um, just, I, I guess, maybe a little bit of clarification on that. And I, I think the, uh, well, the, the criteria should have been in the, in the packet as, as part of that attachment. But um, I think the way we, we think about the innovativeness is um, certainly what's, what's weighted most heavily is, is VMT reduction. So certainly a lot of the tried and true uh, approaches, thank you for screen sharing, uh, the tried and true approaches would probably be scored a, a potentially higher in terms of you know that that element, but we are looking for things maybe that we haven't done or done as much perhaps in this region to learn from. So I'm just thinking in this in this last call for projects. I know we um, uh, I think funded a program for parking cash out as an example uh, for for the first time, and while we're probably only about halfway through. Uh, that particular project, uh, you know, we're really anxious, uh, interested to see what what results we're uh, able to get from that. 
Um, you know, so I, I think it's kind of it's a mix of both. Um, ultimately, VMT reduction is um, is king. It's weighted heaviest, but definitely if we can find something like this parking cash out uh, program that uh, appears to be effective, it is something we want to consider uh, in other parts of the region. Thanks for that explanation, Steve. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Phil. Uh, next, we have Brian Weimer. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, while not, while this question is not directly related to this um, presentation, it is related to TDM services. And my question is, um, how did the last 14 months affect the Dr. Cog Way to Go program? And the $8.8 .8 million that's been allocated to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, um, an excellent question, Brian, and it's been obviously, uh, well, I'll use the term, un unprecedented in, in terms of um, our program or programs and partnership. Uh, we, within, I would say, a couple of months of going into kind of this mandatory telework environment, uh, you know, a year ago, March, um, we uh, recognized that obviously, you know, a lot of people had immediately shifted to telework and we shifted a lot of our efforts uh, to telework. We launched an initiative called uh, Telework Tomorrow to really capitalize on this. And it, you know, and this includes a bunch of uh, resources uh, to, to help organizations that don't have formal telework policies in place and just generally to be, mm -hmm encouraging uh, that. And, you know, in terms of a lot of what the uh, Way to Go program does related to outreach, particularly that obviously didn't happen in the way it has in years past. Uh, this last 15 months or so, uh, we immediately had to shift from, um, and this is true of Dr. Cog's outreach staff and our, our uh, TMA partners outreach staff, you know, shift from uh, meeting with employers regularly in person to meeting with employers virtually and obviously focused much focused uh, on on you know sort of a different uh, slate of, of offerings we know that um, you know that there was a lot of hesitation uh, with employees to um, you know to, to, to get on transit even if they were still in the office and anything that had to do with shared rides, uh, you know, we know that it's going to be kind of a, um, a challenge to, to sort of get back to, to normal, but really just about every aspect of what we were doing in the Way to Go program and partnership, uh, you know, changed with COVID. And we are just now sort of laying the foundation for what this looks like because we see some light at the end of the tunnel and, and hopefully emerge from this, um, you know, and are able to go back more to normal operations for sure. Were you able to see any savings with with the program? Well, yeah, certainly um, elements of the program, um, you know, where again, for things like uh, the Guaranteed Ride Home program would be an example. Um, you know, that that has, with the uh, dramatic drop off in in transit ridership. Um, we've seen very little utilization of the Guaranteed Ride Home program, so that's a direct cost savings uh, with our van pool program. Um, roughly 50% of the, the vans that were on the road pre-pandemic are, are currently on the road today. And so there definitely have been uh, cost savings in some of those areas. Um, in other areas, uh, you know, there are, uh, there's sort of the fixed costs, uh, you know, some of the overhead, which really has not changed, uh, you know, as, as dramatically, obviously. So with those savings, are you planning on um, in presenting how you might utilize those funds? And I guess where, where it might be tied is kind of your call for projects that you're talking about here. Would that make sense to maybe up the percentages if you have, um, or up the dollars available if you have a series of um, good projects that may exceed what's been allocated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think today, uh, you know, in terms of the funding, what, what we're about halfway through, and actually in some cases, 
uh, some of the TDM set aside projects that that were approved for funding this last cycle uh, started a little bit later than anticipated. So uh, at this point in time, there there isn't funding in that particular uh, bucket that we could we could point to. I don't know if, if folks would remember or not, but we did have in this first call for projects uh, two years ago. We had um, some additional funding that had been. Uh, basically returned either from uh, partnership grants or from previous TDM set aside grants that we sort of rolled into it. Um, right now, there's well, there's 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 not a lot in there at this point in time. And again, I think because a lot of the the current TDM set aside projects are really either at the midway point or just past the midway point, and you know don't have a final report and or even accounting on that part of it yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next, we have Jessica Furco. Yeah, hopefully, I pronounced your name correctly. You got it. <laughs> Thanks so thank much. Um, my question is, I, I think, a little bit um, on kind of how to read this document, so I apologize in advance for that. But um, is there additional information on the metrics that kind of inform the scoring range? Um, like, so like in table A, it just is like low range high, um, for example. And I was just kind of wondering if there's a little more context for that. Yeah, really the, you know, sort of the stuff that's in schedule mm -hmm. A, Jessica, um, yeah. is there, there's, there's a fair amount of, I mean, there is some subjectivity to that based mm -hmm. on, um, you know, a particular, how a particular individual might think about it. And that's one of the reasons we really are um, intentional about getting that review panel together multiple times is because, you know, somebody um, in terms of level of innovation and uniqueness, as, as an example, might feel like, you know, a particular project, um, you know, deserves to be scored much, much higher uh, <clears throat> than others. I will say under, on BMT reduction, um, Dr. Cog certainly has uh, some information that is available in terms of sort of how we calculate BMT reduction for these types of, of projects, and, and we would typically um, provide that information both to uh, applicants and, and certainly to our review panel. That may be one of the few, at least in the in section A, where there would be metrics or numbers behind it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the, the, the other section, sort of the data-driven section, uh, we, we lean heavily on um, our our uh, TPO folks to uh, map, uh, you know, a particular project area, and 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 score in, in that area. And, and on some of these, it's either in or out, like in an EJ mm -hmm. area, as an example. So you'd typically see either a six or a one, or I guess if it was partly, you know, in an EJ area, as an example, you might see a, you know, something in between a three or or so. Does that answer your question, Jessica? Or, or yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I just want to make sure I had my head wrapped around it correctly. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, John um, Cotton, did you want to I notice you were having trouble raising your hand? Were you wanting to make a comment on this? Uh, no, I'm just, I just wanted to make sure I was in. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, John. I believe that's the last of the questions or comments on this item. Thank you, Steve. And with that, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is the Metro Vision Plan uh, Transportation Measure uh, Target Amendments. And Jacob, if you're ready. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a second to share my presentation. Okay, folks can see that? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog, um, along with several of my colleagues, we're gonna do a sort of presentation by committee today. Um, but we did wanna start a conversation around the topic of potential transportation amendments to the Metro Vision Plan 
um, based on the work that has been done in the um, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan um, that the board just adopted last month. So just start out with a little bit of context here. Um, Dr. Cog's staff, primarily my colleagues in our regional planning uh, and development division have been discussing with the Dr. Cog board potential amendments to Metro Vision Plan outcomes, objectives, measures, targets, and strategic initiatives. Um, the rationale for that is that the Metro Vision Plan, as many of you remember, was last adopted fully in 2017. Um, maybe some minor updates since then, but really the plan was adopted in 2017. And so here we are in 2021, we wanna align um, the Metro Vision Plan to a lot of the great work that we've done at Dr. Cog, um, and it has been done around the region um, since 2017. So we're talking about ultimately a formal Metro Vision Plan amendment process that would occur probably later in 2021, um, but we wanted to start laying the groundwork in terms of some of the concepts um, and topics and things that we're thinking about. So with that, let me turn it over to my counterpart, um, Andy Taylor from our uh, Regional Planning and Development Division. Andy. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Uh, just as a reminder of how MetroVision is structured, it follows the same strategic framework that Dr. Cog uses as an organization. We even share those top two levels, the mission and vision between both Dr. Cog and MetroVision. Uh, and as Jacob mentioned, we've been working on discussing some of what we're calling potential staff initiated proposed changes uh, with the board uh, earlier this year. And we focus primarily at these um, outcome and objective levels. Uh, and we, these proposals have been focused all on how other state or regional efforts since MetroVision's passage in 2017 uh, could be better reflected. And so uh, it's worth mentioning that the regional transportation plan is one of those efforts um, that, that we're hoping to reflect uh, with this amendment. And so we're now at the level of workshopping our staff initiated proposals for measure and target changes. Uh, but we wanted to make sure to get some feedback from this committee before advancing uh, to our board for some preliminary discussion. Next slide. Uh, MetroVision is a team sport. Uh, it really involves the activities, the actions and activities of many partners. Uh, measures are a way of tracking progress towards the desired outcomes in the plan. Uh, they are regional collective measures and it is really important to note this is language from our, our plan. Uh, they're not intended to judge individual projects or places. Uh, we do have some criteria for what we can consider as a MetroVision measure. Uh, relevance to plan outcomes is usually not the breaking point. Uh, we have more topics covered in the plan uh, than we can directly measure with individual uh, items. Uh, data availability is one of the biggest issues that can make or break an ideal measure. Uh, additionally, we have other ways to feature anecdotal success or achievements through MetroVision.DrCog.org, but not as measures slide. And just because um, something is quantitative uh, doesn't mean we should automatically make it a measure. Uh, Dr. Cog issues other reports, studies, data briefs that can help tell the story of progress toward MetroVision outcomes. Uh, sometimes we may get a one-time or fairly infrequent data set. Uh, other times we may be evaluating a fairly new data set and might wanna wait and see if it, if it proves to be regular and reliable, but we have other ways of communicating that information outside of just performance measures. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Jacob. Thank you, Andy. So specifically in terms of the topic of transportation, um, this slide is conveying the transportation uh, related, either direct transportation or closely transportation related um, measures within uh, the current Metro Vision Plan. Um, there's approximately, I think, about 15 total measures um, in the Metro Vision Plan, and close to half of them um, have some, you know, direct or very close relationship um, to transportation. So the table that you're seeing here on this slide shows those measures, shows the baseline that we have uh, from back when we were first putting Metro Vision together, um, and then shows the existing uh, 2040 target um, that's currently in the Metro Vision Plan. Um, so specifically regarding transportation, when we were preparing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we committed that we wanted to use that process to be thoughtful about kind of re-examining this relationship between the 2050 RTP and the Metro Vision Plan. And in particular, we wanted the 2050 planning process to really set that foundation for some potential updates or changes to the measures and targets uh, relating to these transportation measures within uh, Metro Vision. 
Um, and if you recall in chapter four, as noted on the slide of the 2050 RTP, uh, we actually laid out um, kind of some detailed, as much detailed as we had at the time, staff thinking about, you know, what is the 2050 planning process? What is the RTP telling us about uh, maybe some potential changes to uh, the measures and or the targets uh, to some of these transportation measures within the Metro Vision Plan. So we're gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, we'll start with safety. This is probably the most defined one. Um, as you all know, we adopted taking action on Regional Vision Zero uh, back about last summer. Um, obviously we've committed to a zero target uh, for fatalities and serious injuries. When we originally adopted the Metro Vision Plan back in 2017 at that time, um, the target that we have in the Metro Vision Plan is fewer than 100 uh, traffic fatalities annually by 2040. Now with this commitment to zero, we've had conversation with our board of directors about, you know, what could that look like? How do we go about implementing that? And based on direction from the board, uh, we have settled on zero fatalities by 2040 and zero serious injuries by 2045. So that's a pretty clear sort of metric. This is how we would propose to amend the Metro Vision Plan uh, regarding the safety uh, the safety measure and the safety targets um, for uh, Metro Vision based on um, the 2050 work. So next topic is congestion. I'm gonna turn this one over to my colleagues, Robert Spots and Melissa Balding. Hey there. Um, so right now we have two measures that uh, for congestion, uh, TTV, which is uh, basically, basically measures the difference between travel time um, during the off peak hours versus peak. So how severe is congestion? Um, you know, it, it, it's a pretty good metric we think. Um, we do think the baseline is a little confusing or the, the values that are used. So when we say 1.22, what that actually means is it takes you about 22% longer to travel during the peak period than the off peak period as a regional average. So we've considered just kind of rebranding that one so that um, you know, it would make a little more sense to um, somebody that didn't, didn't understand the metric of 1.22. The second one is another debate. It's daily person delay per capita. And right now that's at six minutes. The target is to keep um, congestion to the point where it's less than nine minutes. Um, you know, we, we've struggled with whether we want two congestion metrics or whether one is good enough. And if we do want to, should we consider changing that second one? Um, it may be more complementary to look at when, when we're talking about TTV or travel time variation, we're talking about severity of congestion. There's kind of a, a other aspects of congestion we're interested in, like the magnitude, how many people that affects. This one captures that pretty well, daily person delay. But we're also missing uh, things like duration, um, how long is congestion? You know, we have we have a, many strategies for how to deal with congestion during the peak hours, including the TDM program you just heard about from Steve. Uh, is, is there other ways we, we want to evaluate congestion in terms of those peak periods leaking over into the off-peak periods? Um, you know, when, um, and should, should we look at how bad is congestion during, during off-peak and, and keep that how many people are affected? So should there be a second me measure is what we're considering? And also, should we change that second one? And next slide. So some things we talked about, um, again, we, I think we believe we should probably keep travel time variation. We think it's an effective um, metric. Again, kind of rebranding it a little bit. Um, another one we've considered is just off-peak travel in severe congestion. So how much of the off-peak, the mid-peak, midday, experiences congestion levels? Um, and then uh, that, that third one down there, network with extended congestion. How much of the network has um, you know, many, many hours per day, five or more, we could, we'll, we'll still play with the thresholds, but how, many, how much of the network has extended, extended congestion where, you know, that segment may be congested throughout the entire day. And then the last one kind of takes into account the, the magnitude portion with people. How many people are traveling on those roadways with extended um, congestion on them? Again, these values are still a little bit rough. They're, they're just initial um, uh, attempts at evaluating the baseline. And then there'd be a lot of discussion about what the target may be for 2050. Am I on this one too, Jacob? Yes, sir. So, <laughs> so right now we have a we have a you know a, a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the region. Right now, that uh, that target is based on per capita emissions. So um, while it looks like as as a growing region, um, as vehicles get cleaner, it it makes it look like um, our emissions may be going down. When in fact, 
emissions from greenhouse gases from the transportation sector are basically remaining level throughout the course of the plan through the year 2050. Um, that's as our population grows significantly, vehicles also get a lot cleaner, and this is kind of without taking into account electric vehicles. So um, I think we, we don't love the per capita portion of this target, um, given the current context. And then, um, especially in the context of State House Bill uh, 191261, um, which is going to apply very aggressive greenhouse gas targets for the transportation sector. That's still up in the air exactly what that means, but um, we may want to consider revising our target to be consistent with the outcome of that final, that final rulemaking, which is scheduled for um, August this year. Okay, um, next topic that we've been thinking about, um, something related to transit service quality. So the notion here is that this would be a new measure uh, potentially within uh, the Metro Vision Plan. And we're interested in something, you know, measure and target that really focuses on some aspect of transit quality, transit usefulness, you know, something that really um, pays attention to the importance of transit within our region. Um, as indicated on the slide, and as most of you know, RTD is currently addressing um, these topics through the Reimagine RTD process, uh, which recently restarted. Um, so we are proposing that uh, we wait for the outcomes of Reimagine uh, so that we can be consistent with that work that RTD is currently undertaking, use that process, use those outcomes to define uh, what this potential measure and target uh, would be. Having said that, um, when we get to the end of the presentation and have our, have our discussion, both Dr. Kaga and RTD staff are interested if there is some initial TEC input um, on this topic. Um, next one is active transportation. Um, Melissa, I think you've got this one. Yeah, absolutely. This one in a, is another um, additional new measure uh, that is being considered. Uh, right now we have the non-SOV, measure and a greenhouse gas measure. And of course, both of those kind of relate to active transportation in a way. Um, and so the goal of adding a, a new active transportation measure is to be able to track, um, you know, what Dr. Cog can control and help contribute to, um, which is the built environment um, and giving people options for active transportation. And so we're actually considering um, adding two measures as it relates to active transportation. Um, to address both the quantity and the quality of the transportation system and build off of the work um, that was done in the active transportation plan, which was a really collaborative process and had a lot of community buy-in. So we wanna continue building on that. So the first um, proposed metric is the active transportation corridor mileage completion. So active transportation corridor, those are identified in the active transportation plan. And then by mileage, how many of those have been completed. Um, and this is really a good option um, to consider uh, not just miles of facilities, but kind of strategic miles of facilities that exist, knowing that these corridors were identified because of the connectedness um, that they might provide and filling in kind of a regional network and closing gaps and um, yeah, creating facilities that people would use from um, yeah, that side of things. Um, and then the second measure that's being considered on the metric is um, kind of considering the share of these facilities that are high comfort, identifying high comfort facilities as separated bike lanes, off street facilities such as paths, um, and bicycle boulevards, which are low speed, low volume um, streets that have some uh, infrastructure that supports cycling. So um, that is to uh, really address that. We know that not all uh, facilities are created equally. And so we want to measure the quality of, of facilities, which kind of tracks the usability um, across uh, different user groups. And so those are the two measures um, that we're considering. Right now, the numbers you see in there under the measures are just placeholders. Um, and as we move forward with this, we'll kind of come up with the new real numbers for that. Um, and as Andy discussed, these two are the ones we landed on because of the importance of having reliable data that we can track. And Dr. Cog has a bicycle network inventory um, that could provide the information we need to be able to track this year over year. Um, the active transportation plan, this would be the last thing I said, would say is not um, intended to be static. And so one challenge with 
uh, these measures in particular, the first one is the active transportation corridors might evolve and change as land use demands change and where people are and where they would want to go on bikes might change. And so, you know, some numbers we might identify, some years we might identify new corridors. Um, and so there might be a little bit of shifting around that. Um, it's not totally static. Nonetheless, we think that's the most meaningful way to um, address yeah, the quantity of facilities and then lead into the quality and building off of all the work that's been done. So that's all I would say on that. Thanks, Jacob. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, we have at least one more and I'll turn this back to Andy. All right, so uh, here is a, a measure that we are actually talking about removing uh, as it was put in the initial uh, Metrovision plan back in 2017, uh, the version that was adopted then. Um, the proposal to remove this um, and, and we're focusing on replacing with a new housing related measure. This is a measure related to housing and transportation costs. Uh, this is data that's put out by the Center for Neighborhood Technology uh, very periodically. The, the big problem with it here is that transportation costs are not measured in any of the surveys that we rely on or that they rely on in creating that. And they're the only ones who are typically modeling this um, and yet they have not updated that metric. They've updated it um, once uh, since we took our baseline measurement. So we have a 2013 measure and a 2015 measure. Uh, which are really actually modeled um, and not, not true observations. And so um, because it's no longer really meeting the criteria that we've set in the plan, um, we're going to be talking to the board about uh, removing this measure and focusing instead on uh, something more related to just housing in, the, in, in this area. Great. Thanks, Andy. So just to wrap up, I know we've thrown a lot at you and when we get into conversation, we can certainly come back to any of these particular measures. Um, but in general, we wanted to present this information to you. We wanted to get some initial input. In particular, we're interested about um, the direction of proposed changes to the Metrovision transportation measures and targets, um, particularly where we've presented some options. You know, does it feel like we're going the right direction? Are any particular options appealing or unappealing for a particular reason? Um, and as well, your reaction to uh, the proposed new measures um, and options that we've laid out as well. Um, so I think that's our last slide. And Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you for, this is just an informational item, but happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Jacob and team. Um, are there any uh, questions uh, for the team or comments? And I see Brian has raised his hand. So Brian, you're first. Great, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is going to be around the congestion component. So Robert or, or Jacob can answer that. And, and did you consider, you know, I know when your congestion model, you have a mobility grade, um, which combines what five different um, elements of congestion that being delay and travel time index or various uh, variance and crashes and that sort of thing, such that you could look at a percentage of the network at a, let's call it a poor mobility grade versus a excellent, good or fair mobility grade. Did you talk about oh, that a little Brian, bit? Brian, I think, I think that's a really good idea. I think that's definitely worth, worth exploring. Um, yeah, I, I think we should play around with that because I, I do think that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Phil Greenwald. Phil. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Staying on this slide, I guess, and just kind of going on with what Brian said. Um, is there a chance, you know, we, we always try to figure out how to solve congestion. Is there, is there a way that we could maybe taking a, on what, what was just said, is, is there a way to kind of talk about corridors where you could actually opt out of congestion as far as, you know, is it a, is it a managed lane facility? Is it a rapid transit facility that's in that same corridor rather than trying to solve the traffic congestion in that corridor, the traffic, those issues, rather than just solving that is just trying to work into a different mode that would get you out of, um, that congestion altogether by using different modes. So that was one thing that came up 
kind of in our Boulder County discussion again, I wanted to make sure that got out there. Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. Um, you know, we it's it's a little bit challenging because this is a these are regional metrics, right? So we're not really focusing on specific corridors and solutions for those specific corridors. They're kind of um, especially these are kind of taking an aggregate of a ton of of all the, the entire roadway network, frankly, and all the travel and the levels of congestion. Um, so regionally, it's a little challenging to do that, I would suggest. Um, when you look at specific corridors, especially when you're getting to NEPA studies, obviously that's a very uh, critical component of, of evaluating a corridor. And I know these are more regional in nature and, and but you know, coming from the kind of more city centric point of view is we've kind of given up on like trying to uh, add capacity to a bunch of roadways because we're kind of in Longmont anyway, we're built out. We don't have a lot of space to grow the roads other than you know ripping down a bunch of historical buildings or 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 going through people's homes. So we're really trying to manage this at a different level. And so we're just hoping that regionally you could see that issue as well and and mitigate it that way. So that's great. Yeah. So thanks for thanks for talking about that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I will mention, Phil. You know, we always we always promote our. Um, there are three A's: the uh, you know, avoid, alleviate, and address congestion. So, uh, obviously, we we're very concerned about other ways of addressing congestion. Great. I also had some other questions, but um, if others want to ask about congestion, I'll I'll yield and ask my question. I have a greenhouse gas question as well. Why don't you go ahead, Phil, and ask that one, and then we'll. We'll take each of, of these folks. Well, around. and maybe I'm just confused. Is the so Colorado CDOT or the state of Colorado has come out with the GHG pollution reduction roadmap, right? So, um, how does that play into this? And then, I mean, I know you're waiting for the rulemaking to come, and so is, that must be separate then from what we're seeing in this roadmap. Is that correct? It's, it is a little bit separate, but very directly related, right? So right now, the roadmap kind of spells out what they are hoping that the transportation sector's reductions will be by, by the horizon year 2050. Well, in, in interim horizon years as well. Um, so 2026, 2030. Um, right now, there's a rulemaking for how transportation, the transportation planning process in, in particular should, should be helping support that final target. Um, so it's a little unclear what that looks like. We, you know, Dr. Cog and, and you know, many, many local governments have been participating in the initial policy development for this rulemaking, but we don't have specific answers for, uh, you know, which we may have in the future that Dr. Cog's emissions should be X by 2030 or 2050, and that may help us determine and define our target, which um, if, if we choose to, we could revise our internal target to um, be consistent with that state rulemaking. Okay, great. And then one last question, if I may, um, re regarding the affordable housing and transportation piece, where you recommend to uh, replace it with just the new housing measure. It's just, we're, we're trying to figure out, uh, again, this is kind of more of the Boulder County representative folks. We're just trying to figure out how we then um, relate that to proximity to the housing, because a lot of the costs, if it's housing and transportation, a lot of those costs, uh, you know, play off each other, especially in Boulder County, where it's kind of expensive to live, right? Um, but in order to get people, if you can move people closer to the transportation, you know, if it could be something like um, housing within a quarter to half mile of, of transit, that would help maybe alleviate that dual cost, those dual costs and bring the total costs down for folks who have to pay a high price for the housing, but then they can lower their transportation costs. So we'd, we'd hate to see that removed entirely without that consideration for proximity to transportation or, tra you know, mass transit or, or public transit. So uh, just something that we were considering. And with that, I appreciate all your time. Thanks for taking all my questions. Thank you, Phil. Next, we have Rick Pilgrim. Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Andrew, Jacob, Robert, Melissa, good job on this. Um, I, uh, Phil and I maybe have been working together too long because uh, the, uh, the topic he just brought up is, is the same topic that caught my eye. Uh, you know, removing this, this 
measure and replacing of the new housing related measure. The reason that uh, I, I think that's important, uh, Phil had an example that I hadn't really thought about. Uh, you know, it's expensive for uh, for employees to live close to where they were if they're in Boulder County. Um, I was coming at it more from the the question of economic equity and anticipating what the Biden administration is doing with uh, the American Jobs Plan and the emphasis on you know features like uh, climate change, equity, uh, jobs. Um, to, to me, that it seems like we're missing uh, a way to consider equity and um, you know, following up on what, what you did with the RTP, uh, the, the six focus areas, safety, air quality, regional transit, multimodal mobility, active transportation and freight. And then you had a nice section on uh, EJ and, and equity considerations. Um, I, I think, I mean, what measured gets done, what is measured gets accomplished. And, and if we're not measuring something related to equity, I don't know how we're going to accomplish that. Uh, you know, and, and two of the two of the themes in MetroVision are, you know, a vibrant regional economy and healthy and inclusive and livable communities. So, uh, I I mean, I couldn't. I don't really have any great ideas like like Phil had about a specific measure. I do know that some regions, uh, the Bay Area, for example, is really tackling this topic and getting into it in some detail so that as they they do another uh, bar crossing of the Bay, uh, they'll be able to uh, make decisions that, that have this equity lens in there. So uh, not to filibuster, but I, I wonder if, if uh, that's reflected somewhere else, or if we should take a look at it. Um, I'm happy to address where um, it may be uh, uh, included elsewhere. Um, just to mention what what uh, we do have, um, I still have a measure related to uh, housing and jobs near near uh, high frequency or rapid transit. Uh, th that measures those those two measures aren't going away. Um, but that doesn't always ref get at some of what I think uh, the, the board's desire and other folks desire was through this measure. Um, just because some of those those opportunities may be rather high cost. Um, and so uh, we are trying to consider more what we would call uh, areas with better access to opportunity. Uh, these, these can be difficult to define. We, we've replicated an approach that the uh, that Enterprise uh, Community Partners ha has uh, uh, put in place um, to, to try and uh, look at that at a, a census tract level, but that data is not updated as regularly as we, we would we would hope for for a measure. Um, so we're really trying to to still tell stories about these areas uh, uh, with better access to opportunity or not. That said, we are uh, considering uh, what we would call um, some inclusion measures, trying to really get at the tail end of this to try and see. Uh, how this is contributing to disparities. And right. so there are some proposals that will, will be uh, discussed uh, at the board um, related to that. There's a geographic inclusion measure and a racial inclusion measure uh, proposal that, that um, will hopefully either make it to our board work session if we have one in June or be an informational item at the board uh, later in June. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, sorry, thanks, Rick. Thanks. Andy. Um, I, I'm talking over somebody here, uh, but also not not sure what uh, USDOT is going to come out. Um, you know, part of the uh, well, it's it's hard to tell exactly what they're going to to be asking for, but uh, it was uh, written that that maybe up to 40 percent of of what they would then award in uh, in funding would be through an equity lens of some sort. I think we need to be prepared for that. Yeah, Rick, this is Jacob, and I really appreciate that comment. 
um, I wanted to supplement Andy's answer in terms of just, you know, sort of generally, how do we deal with, you know, these issues of, of equity? Um, because it's, you know, beyond what Andy said in the Metro Vision Plan itself, um, there's a lot that we do at Dr. Cog and our partner agencies do around the country um, in terms of this overall issue of equity and transportation. And without getting into a lot of detail at this moment, suffice to say that in addition to having an overall Title VI plan, uh, which we're actually in the process of updating, uh, limited English proficiency plan, Americans with disability um, access plan, and some of the other things that we're required to have, uh, we are also trying to take great strides both internally as an organization, but also externally um, in terms of our plans and our funding about how we deal with equity. Uh, we devoted a, a lot more effort to it in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan in terms of our environmental justice analysis, our population-based approach. Um, equity is also a big part of the transportation improvement program um, in terms of how we make some of those funding decisions um, and other areas that equity permeates as well. So again, without turning this into a long answer, just the point is it's more than just what's in the Metro Vision Plan. It really is sort of baked into our overall transportation planning process and funding um, of projects. Thank you. Thank you, Rip. Um, next, we have Eugene Howard, City and County of Denver. Eugene. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, a, a lot of my comments were uh, addressed by Phil and Rick, so I'll keep it pretty short. Um, uh, I do think that there is uh, some value in continuing to look for ways to uh, hold on to or, or track our transportation costs in addition to how they relate to housing. So uh, as others have said, I think it would be valuable to try to look for ways to hold on to that particular measure so that we don't lose sight of it too, too much. And I heard from the other responses that those are looked at and baked into other programs. So I think that that's good. Um, I wanted to just voice some support for the transit service quality. I think it's one thing to have transit service, but if it's uh, not meeting the needs of a, a number of people, then you know, I, there's just opportunities there. So I, I think if we are looking for ways to improve and enhance and support uh, more frequent and perhaps more useful service, I think that's a, a great step in the right direction. Um, and, in, and linked to that would be the active transportation. Uh, I, I hope that uh, we are able to take some positives out of this last year and recognizing that when people uh, are given either time or the opportunity to try to walk places, roll, ride their bikes places, that we need to make sure that we have an infrastructure regionally in place to help people move around without the need for you know, a gas powered automobile. So. I really hope that we can take what we've learned from how people chose to move around in this last 14 or so months and look for opportunities to continue supporting that even once health conditions improve. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see how the active transportation would go in support of our multimodal uh, desires and aspirations and, and really push the needle uh, in, that, in that space. Um, and then uh, the last thing that I, I, I really wanted to mention is if we do look for ways to reflect housing differently, I would ask that there be uh, you know, special attention paid to those jurisdictions that are landlocked, uh, uh, like many places in and around Denver, uh, so that we are making sure that we are doing uh, the um, supply and demand justice. Uh, in addition to some of the other things that have been mentioned around uh, gentrification and displacement and where uh, populations of color are, are having to move. Um, and you know, how might we look to temper that through providing more opportunities where people currently exist. And as the shifts in our populations continue to occur, how might we create a, a system at the regional level uh, to lessen the impact on our our, you know, our Metro Vision goals, particularly around climate. So I uh, just wanted to throw a few words out in, on those slides in particular, and just thank you for the time. Thank you, Eugene. Did Jacob or anybody have a response? Um, I would just say that I really appreciate all the, the comments. This is the type of feedback we're looking for, so thank you. 
Uh, next, we have uh, hey, Max. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, it's Cam Kennedy. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I do see a hand raised from Mac Callison still. Yes, um, I was just calling on him. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mac, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent. Uh, yes, I'd like to echo. I, I appreciate everyone's comments. Uh, they're truly relevant and pertinent, I think, uh, to the conversation, particularly in terms of equity and as it relates to housing and access to transit uh, and really serving populations, equity communities um, uh, across the board on that. Uh, particular observation on the active transportation measures, it, it's, it seemingly addresses the uh, an inventory of facilities, if you will, or accounting of, of, of the nature and type of facilities. Um, I, I think what might be useful is actually how do we target and assess utilization, use uh, certainly of, of bike ped uh, facilities, uh, micro transit mobility uh, device utilization. Uh, across the board. So, and, and probably most importantly, how are we making those connections uh, of the networks, of the, of the bike ped networks, uh, trail systems from, uh, from communities uh, of, of residents to activity centers, to employment centers, uh, to corridors, uh, the like on that. So something to, something to consider, be interested in, uh, in furthering this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. I believe that I do not see any other uh, additional hands up. Um, we did have a comment that we need to also perhaps consider uh, uh, utilizing telework in, in, in maybe one of these uh, scenarios. So I thought that was a good comment. I think that came from uh, Frank Bruno. So uh, it's in the chat. With that, uh, we'll move on to uh, the next item, item seven, the fiscal year 2024-2027 transportation improvement uh, plan uh, policy development, the regional chair project uh, eligibility. And this continues some of the discussion that we had uh, last month. And um, I'm sure we'll have several more uh, interim check-ins as this goes through. So, um, so it's time to dive into this. And Todd, I'll let you uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, as you said, uh, this is a continuation of the discussions that we started with uh, last month. And uh, hopefully we'll see some, um, some of your agreement on some of these topics here. So, oops, let's. All right, so concerning the regional share definition, um, some of the discussions that took place uh, this last month, um, you know, really focused in on what we heard um, were some of the answers to the questions that you're looking for here on that you see on the screen, you know, ranging from, you know, who benefits from a regional project? Um, does it move freight or uh, what kind of users does it draw? Um, so Dr. Cog's staff, um, you know, took some of this information that we heard and um, the feelings that we sort of were looking at within a definition was to try to keep this as, as broad as possible and really provide that connection between both Metro Vision and the RTP back to the regional share of the TIP process and really let the projects that are selected for funding and ultimately uh, you know, contained within the TIP document, let those projects um, really answer some of those questions and let that eligibility at this stage kind of gear us towards that direction. Um, so the definition that staff would recommend is regional share projects and programs serve to achieve the regional outcomes and objectives of the Metro Vision Plan and the regionally funded project and program investment priorities set by the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so I think at, at this time, Mr. Chair, if you're all right, I'd like to sort of run through the remaining part of this presentation, and then we can sort of go back topic by topic to take any questions or comments. Yeah, that would be fine, Todd. Let's go ahead and run okay. through and then we'll come back okay. topic by topic. Sounds good, thank you. Um, so here we move on to the funding eligibility. Um, so for those who are familiar with the existing project process in the regional share, 
um, there is a maximum submittal amount of $20 million. Uh, and that is, uh, comes with a minimum match of 50%. So some of the discussions that we heard last month um, you, you know, range from lowering this match to certainly something lower, perhaps 20%, but then also retaining that match at 50%. Um, in, in taking in that feedback, the recommendations um, that we're looking at is to keep that $20 million uh, maximum submittal amount, but also add in a $5 million minimum request. Um, the exception to this would be for studies. So studies, again, could be lower than that amount. Um, the recommendation would also be to lower that minimum match from 50% down to 20%. And again, with the goal of sort of maintaining the regional project size within this share. So now we get into the types of projects that would be eligible and the location of those projects. So last month, uh, we heard relatively minimal discussion on these, but in general, from what we did here was to keep everything somewhat similar to how the project type and location and eligibility is set up to how it was for the 20 to 23 tip cycle. So the staff recommendations is essentially to update this criteria from what was the 2040 RTP to the 2050 RTP, but really focus in on that regionally funded fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities in the current staging period, so 20 to 29. Um, for programs, the eligibility would remain the same. Uh, any program recommended for funding would need to be region-wide. Um, and then also the next couple slides get into the individual projects that would be eligible. So for transit projects, uh, this really focuses in on two of the project and program investment priorities, the regional bus rapid transit network and the corridor transit planning project and program. So for transit projects, it would any project that would implement a connected BRT network or further define desired transit service along specific corridors via meaningful next steps investments as identified in the RTP. Um, the projects that are recommended within this category uh, would need to be identified in table 3.1 um, within the current staging period of the RTP. Um, the next would be to focus in on the active transportation program. Um, any active transportation, pro transportation project that would be eligible that would need to close a gap on and between the regionally defined active transportation corridors. So eligible projects may or may not be identified within table 3.1 within the current stage and period of the RTP. Uh, additional requirement would need to be that any projects recommended would need to be within an adopted plan. Projects, um, they're broken into two categories. So first would be arterial safety and regional vision zero projects and programs. Um, this would look for projects that would address travel safety on the um, high injury network, which is taken from the taking action on regional any of these projects would need to be on a higher. Um, eligibility goes on to say that these projects don't, don't necessarily have to be with, on uh, table 3.1. For the multimodal capacity projects, um, these tables must be identified within table 3.1 of the current staging period of the RTP. Um, and very similar to how this was constructed in the last cycle, roadway reconstruction projects and any projects on tollways would not be eligible. Um, for the regional managed lane system projects, just like we had in the past, uh, this would not be carried forward as this is covered within the multimodal capacity projects. Uh, very similar to how the rail freight system was in the 20 to 23 cycle. Um, the uh, next cycle could focus on the freight program. So another um, project and program investment priority. Uh, these eligible projects would focus to implement adopted multimodal freight plans. Um, these eligible projects include any project located on a major region where its primary uh, scope elements 
would improve freight movement. Um, projects may or may not be listed um, in the freight. Hey, Todd. Todd. Todd, you muted yourself. Todd, this is Ron. You muted yourself and you're breaking up a little bit. You might want to try turning off your video for a little bit. You're still muted. Hello. Uh, Todd, can you hear us? This is Cam. I apologize. Can everyone hear me now? We guess yes, we can. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. So um, I believe we are on studies at the moment. Um, so eligible studies, um, the limit must include the entire MPL boundary um, and specifically address one of the following. So it must address transit, which includes the BRT or a transit corridor. Um, active transportation, arterial safety, or freight. Uh, and finally, um, the recommendation is to not carry forward the multimodal projects category. Uh, for one, we're un it's unknown at this time if we will have the multimodal um, options funding, um, but also some of these individual categories that were, in, were uh, eligible in the last cycle could certainly fit under one of these other um, on one of these other eligible networks. Um, now we can move on to the actual application submittal process and in the, in the evaluation. Um, uh, for those that recall the existing project, uh, each subregion is limited to three applications. Um, there's an also uh, CDOT and RTD are eligible to submit two applications each. Those applications um, submitted from the subregions um, go to Dr. Cog to score, um, and then a project review panel um, would discuss, prioritize, and recommend those projects. Um, at this time, staff is recommending no changes to that process. Uh, and finally, we can introduce the topic of the regional and subregional funding split. Um, so the existing funding split is 20% to the regional share and 80% to the subregional share. Um, at this time, staff is recommending no changes um, due to this, um, due to a couple items. Uh, so one, the regional share eligibility that I just went through, um, at least at the time of this presentation before we have discussion, uh, is certainly proposed to be very similar to how the um, regional share was, uh, you know, exists in the 20 to 23 tip process. There's also a lot of unknown uh, things going on at both the state and the federal level, which certainly may change the trajectory of how this tip process is really undertaken. Um, it's certainly possible in, you know, five to six months from now, there may be a lot more information in which we could have another discussion. But again, I think at this time, um, our recommendation would be to leave that funding split at 20% to the regional and 80% to the sub-regional. So that concludes uh, the information I have for you. I will certainly go back here to the top and maybe talk about each one of these uh, individually. So I will turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I noticed Phil Greenwald has his hand up. So Phil, you've got the floor first, go ahead. I'm getting a call at the same time. So um, let me turn that off. 
Uh, thanks, Todd and, and, and Chair. Thank you for letting me have a couple minutes here to ask some questions or maybe just make a comment is maybe more applicable. When you talk about the project eligibility, Todd, on um, in that table 3.1 specifically, when we look at that, um, extremely concerning to Boulder County that all of our NAMS projects, the Northwest Area Mobility Study that we work so hard with uh, RTD on and, and as an entire region up here, in 2014, we worked on that plan and that all of those projects are basically eliminated from any consideration of the regional process is extremely disappointing to us. And it'd be a huge, uh, you know, this is going to hit our politicians pretty hard if it makes it uh, to them. So I just want to give you that warning that this is going to be, um, this is a critical issue for our, for our folks to not see any of those projects on that table 3.1. Well, actually, they're actually scratched out. So it's it's a tough it's a tough pill to swallow for us to see all of our work over the last seven years uh, kind of taken out of this by this uh, process. So just a heads up on that. And then the other piece is just having the um, and this is much smaller, but it's the idea that any kind of study area has to include the whole MPO at this point. I, I think under your new planning pieces, it says the the entire MPO has to be the the study limits there, yeah, in that in that bluish uh, shaded box, kind of second from the bottom there. Uh, we don't understand that, but again, that's a much smaller issue. We just wanted to kind of get your reasoning behind that as well, but really address that table 3.1 if you could, and let us know how we can work with you to kind of fix that, make sure projects we can get some projects on that list and still be considered eligible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Phil. So uh, talking about the studies first, uh, the, the general concept behind this is, you know, these are, we're talking about the regional share. Um, so we're really looking for the projects that can speak to on a regional level. Um, and hence that's sort of why we went with the entire MPO boundary. Um, and again, a, a secondary part of that is to focus really that connection uh, between the project and program investment priority, priorities of the RTP, hence making a, a somewhat narrow connection uh, you know, to the four that are listed on the screen. Um, in terms of table 3.1, um, it really comes down to um, using the, the limited funding that we have available um, towards projects that can make an investment at this time period for the current staging period. Um, it's really a matter of what can we do now? Um, and just keeping in mind, um, any, any project that is outside of that staging period uh, would certainly need to go through a somewhat lengthy RTP amendment um, before any TIP projects, um, you know, really could be open to the public along that along that location. Yeah, just as a quick follow up, um, you know, we're doing a lot of work on a lot of these projects already with the past TIP and and the one before that actually. So um, that just seems strange that we're talking about a staging period. If, if that piece could be removed, I think we're all in good shape. But by keeping the staging period and talking about these projects that we're already kind of in the throes of, you know, State Highway 119 specifically and State Highway 7 um, as well, it's just really tough to kind of hear that we can't go after these regional tip share dollars and those projects that are underway and very regional in nature. So thank you. So, oh, hey, hey, Phil, this is this is Ron. I just want to add in a little bit because this is, I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, I, it, it probably would be beneficial to have an offline conversation with some Boulder County folks about how how Boulder County projects got put in the plan in that staging period um, and how that relates to the preferred staging period that the project sponsor requested when submitting the projects for consideration for the plan. Because part of the issue here is that you know, this tip cycle we're establishing a policy for, it's not all tips for from now forever, it's for the next tip cycle that covers the four years, uh, fiscal year 24 through fiscal year 27, which is within this current RTP staging period 20 to 29. 
And so we're not we're not allocating funds for that 30 to 40 time frame yet. And the plan is fiscally constrained. It's a very delicate balance that we have to meet to say this is the amount of money we expect to have available. And we can only fit so many projects in those different staging periods, right? With the amount of money that we have. So any any move to, to move a project and fund it sooner in that plan means another project can't be funded in that time period that, that's in the plan. And so we need we need to just figure out sort of how that how that works together. I think perhaps, you know, Todd had Todd had a good idea to consider. Um, to me, um, that may be a compromise is that for, for a project that's in, you know, one of these major projects in, that's in the next RTP staging period, maybe we'd allow, maybe we should allow uh, the project sponsor to request project development funds in that TIP to at least prepare that project then for the next TIP cycle after this that would overlap the next RTP staging period so that a project could be ready then to pursue construction funding. Uh, when the time came. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, next, we have Brian Weimer. Brian? Thank you. Um, my question is kind of along the same lines. And, and can you kind of remind us how you came up with these staging periods first? And as I remember in previous tips, there was always the ability to um, move projects forward, move them back, that sort of thing, because the tip was, um, th there was an air quality component associated with that. And we were always balancing within the available funding. So this is a little different than you know, previous ways of doing it, as I remember. Can you respond to that? Yeah, so so maybe I can answer the, the second half of your question and maybe turn it over to Ron or Jacob to answer the, the first half. Um, we have sort of gone back and forth over the years in different tip cycles. Um, some tip cycles we've said any project that's in the fiscally constrained RTP would be eligible as long as you don't um, you know, open to the public um, before the minute, the, the first year of your staging period. Um, in other cycles, we have addressed this in a very similar way to how we're addressing it now, saying, you know, you can only submit for TIP projects that are in the current staging period. So um, it has gone back and forth over the years. Um, the previous 20 to 23 cycle, um, we did open it up to, to any air quality staging period. Um, and, and this cycle, uh, we've chosen to hone that in. Um, so again, maybe I can turn it over to Ron or Jacob to answer more of the RTP related question. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, when it comes to our staging periods, there are some federal requirements that we need to follow around the length of those staging periods and how we set them up. Um, but essentially for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we have three kind of main staging periods, basically 20 to 29, 30 to 39 and 40 to 50. Um, and we wanted to try and keep that sort of as simple as possible. Um, generally our staging periods are either five or 10 years long, but particularly that first staging period as Ron alluded to earlier, um, in this case, our 2020 to 2029 staging period, we always purposely, if we can make that a 10 year staging period to fully accommodate at least one, if not two tip cycles. Um, so again, when it comes to kind of projects in the plan, um, you know, what we're really trying to do is sort of reflect the priorities of fiscal constraint by staging period and the notion that, you know, certain projects are, quote unquote, more ready to be constructed now. Some will come later over the life of the 30 year plan, um, but we do have those fiscal constraint limits within each of those staging periods. So we're frankly trying to honor the regional decisions that we came to together around what are the priorities in the 2050 plan? How are those priorities staged and how can we best implement them through um, this new transportation improvement program. Yeah, I just think that there might need to be some flexibility with that because remember, you know, we're saying that this was an illustrative plan and not for the tip. And now we're kind of integrating the tip into it. So um, there's some concern with that. And I can see where Phil's coming from. 
Hey, hey, Brian, this is this is Ron. I want to I want to clarify that point. I, I, um, the RTP is not an illustrative list of projects. Um, the, the RTP is an expression of the region's priorities uh, for major investments um, over the next thirty years. I don't think I don't think anywhere from Dr. Cog ever said it's just an illustrative list of projects. Um, and for, well, maybe I said that wrong, but it was identified as you know we're not identifying what projects will be funded in the TIP. And now we're utilizing that for funding within the TIP. And I think we're looking at, hey, over this next 30 years, these are the projects that are needed. You know, things change in terms of the demand for various projects. And um, I think there needs to be flexibility as to when that priority is based on things that are even outside of your control. Could be a land use um, issue, could be um, maybe an opportunity that exists out there. And this limits that to a certain extent to the assumptions that were made at the time of the plan development. Yeah, and I, I understand that, Brian. I think from, from my perspective, at least, um, you know, we, we just adopted this plan. And um, so, and we're talking about the regional share of the TIP, not the entirety of the of the TIP, right? This is this is kind of twenty percent of of potentially of the resources that'll be available for the for the most significant regional priorities. So keep that piece in mind, and and those major priorities should have been identified in this in this plan that we just just adopted. And if there were there were issues um, in that plan about the proper staging period for a project. Um, I, uh, I think it's unfortunate if we if we had that miscommunication about kind of those relative priorities. But again, um, maintaining fiscal constraint um, in addition to the air quality conformity um, issues. But the the fiscal constraint there there are only so many dollars to be invested um, with within the plan period and and the tip and funding a project that's identified as a later priority in the plan in this next tip cycle means that another another project can't be funded uh, within that time frame um, that was identified as a as a priority in the plan so i think we just need to have an an open discussion about what those trade-offs are ryan any additional comments oh no not at this time Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, George, you're up. Uh, hi, thank you guys for this presentation. I just need some clarity on when you say 2020 to 29 staging period. Um, so a, a staging period is defined based on when the projects are delivered, like the final date. Like I'm, I'm just re making reference to like looking at the table 3.1 and I'm looking at two uh, Pena Boulevard projects uh, leading to Denver Airport. Um, there were like two phases and one was submitted as 2025 to 2034 and the other as 2030 to 2039. And so I, I just need to understand that those projects that are Partially in this 20 to 29 is like, are they striked out because they're ending in the next 10 year time frame, or like how, how does that work? Yeah, George, this is Jacob. Let me try and clarify that a little bit. Um, again, it comes back to some federal rules about how we define some of this, but in a nutshell, um, we do air quality conformity based on these time periods throughout the plan. So again, we have three staging periods in the 2015 Regional Transportation Plan, and we've actually created model networks for each of those three staging periods. And we've done, um, in cooperation with the state, air quality conformity analysis for each of those three staging periods, ultimately to prove um, to the feds that we are within our motor vehicle emissions budgets by staging period. I mean, that's more to it than that, um, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. So really what that means is that, look, we recognize the plan as a 30-year Plan. And we recognize it as a project sponsor. You may not know exactly in those 30 years precisely what year your project's going to open, but we did ask everyone to estimate to the very best of your ability, you know, which of those three 10 year periods is likely at this time that your project is, is likely to come, come online. And really the definition there is when does your project open 
either to traffic if it's a roadway project or um, to revenue service, let's say if it's a transit project. Um, so a project that's within say the first staging period, 20 to 29, um, for example, it's not so um, critical, does it open in 24, 25 or 26? That's, that's not as critical, but at least what we're saying is that we know within that 10 year period, for example, you know, we have an expectation at this time that within those 10 years, um, that project is gonna be completed and open to service. Does that help? Okay, so yeah, thank you. So the way I read it, so it's basically, you know, if if certain projects are submitted over a period of time from year X to year Y, it's really the year Y, the estimated project opening time that is counted towards, you know, which staging period it belongs to, right? As yeah, as when does that project open for, again, either traffic okay. so, or when is it open for revenue service? Okay, okay, that, that, that explains it. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. I uh, do not see any other hands raised or comments in the chat, so um, we'll move on. Thank you, Todd, for and Ron and Jacob for, for answering questions. Um, as we continue to move forward in this process. Um, next, uh, Steve Cook will be presenting the 2021-2022 statewide uh, multimodal travel survey project. I think it's attachment F in your, uh, in, in your packet. So uh, Steve, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, I need to get permission to share screen here. Uh, there we go. And and let's see. I, know, I think you can see my regular screen. Uh, there we go. Okay, this can do a quick presentation here on the uh, upcoming uh, twenty twenty two. Statewide Multimodal Travel Survey Project. Uh, this is a project that CDOT uh, is going to lead throughout the state. And it'll probably really be a, a multi-year uh, project um, that's gonna be going on. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of just introduction first. And then uh, Eric Sabina, uh, who used to work with Dr. Cog, um, who is a CDOT's information management branch manager. Um, he will talk about some of the details uh, expected at this point in time. It, a lot of things are still draft, um, but he'll talk about what's gonna be going on over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, those of you who have been involved with Dr. Cog for a while may recall that in uh, 2010, uh, we did a front range travel counts household survey, and it was your traditional household diary that was done with all of the MPOs uh, in the front range from Pueblo on up to uh, the North Front Range, Fort Collins uh, area. And so that was done, you know, as you do the math, 10, 11 years ago, and that data is getting outdated. A lot has changed since then. And so uh, CDOT, uh, and all the uh, MPOs around the state talked about, you know, a couple years ago that maybe, you know, it's, it's time to update and conduct a new survey, a new set of surveys, because there'll be a lot of different components to this, as Eric will talk about. And so over the last uh, several months, uh, CDOT has been working with uh, the MPOs from throughout the state, uh, Pikes Peak, uh, North Front Range, Pueblo area, uh, as well as RTD. Uh, in terms of being involved in this and, and others. And I think uh, Eric may note that, uh, you know, even month by month, we're hearing of maybe others who may wanna participate uh, on this project. Um, as you know, last year, the uh, US Census uh, conducted their, uh, I'll call it a survey, but uh, their uh, census work in 2020, and they asked a couple of, you know, travel questions on the survey on the uh, U.S. Census related to uh, mode of travel to work uh, and uh, things such as that. And so this will be a good uh, add-on uh, to the U.S. Census data. Uh, the survey results are very important for many reasons, you know, not just the first item noted there, uh, which is the more technical aspect of 
using survey results to calibrate our uh, regional travel demand model that's used for long range planning, that's used for TIP and air quality conformity. Uh, so it's not just for calibrating that model and statewide model as well. Um, but we've used uh, data from the household survey. Um, there's been many of these conducted over the decades. Uh, we've used it uh, in uh, project evaluation procedures. Um, it's been used uh, for uh, information pieces for board members and others, you know, to help them with their decision making, uh, public officials, local staff around the region. We've, we've pulled things from that old 2010 survey and uh, compiled uh, data queries and tables and would uh, present that information to our, our local governments uh, for them to use. And, and we've had uh, you know, media requests over the years. So very, very important data. And especially with you know, what's been going on the last uh, year, year and a half. And so it's gonna be really important to um, get some good information over the next couple of years. Um, I will keep running the screens here, but we'll let uh, Eric Sabina of CDOT come on now and explain a little bit about some of the components and schedule. Hey all, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks, Cam. Uh, thanks everyone on the tech for uh, taking some time uh, to uh, discuss this topic. Um, it's a little bit of a trip down memory lane for me. So some of you are, know very well that I was at Dr. Cog for some years and have been at uh, CDOT since 2013. And this, is, this project is a bit of a return as well. I led the uh, Fort Range Travel Counts project that Steve made reference to a minute ago when I was a Dr. Cog employee back in 2010. And so, you know, we're sort of here at a, a, another bite at the apple. As, as Steve noted, the, the survey is, you know, potentially going to have a bunch of uh, components. And I do want to, you know, sort of reiterate or note that uh, the, the first task order on this uh, uh, project is the planning phase of the project. You know, we, we have, a, you know, a, I don't want to, how would I put this? We have a sort of a general plan for what the project is to be, but it was always understood that the first tasks of the project would be for the oversight committee of the project to get together and put some more, you know, sort of meat on the bones of, of that general plan. The, the oversight committee is composed at present of basically everybody who's put some money into the project which means uh, CDOT and all of the MPOs, Dr. Cog, of course, included. And um, Steve also alluded to the fact that we've had a number of feelers from other folks, uh, both inside Dr. Cog and in other parts of the state who may be interested in putting in some funding and uh, getting some additional data in their areas. And we will be during this uh, calendar year in discussions with some of those folks to see if they can get to the point of actually contributing funding. So that, you know, that's sort of a stay tuned. And I, I think it almost a certainty that if those folks do come in with some money, then they will also join the oversight committee. The, the, the top bullet here notes sort of what we call traditional household diary surveys. Those are surveys where, you know, the word diary is, is sort of key that we ask people to uh, fill out a travel diary for some period that they're assigned and the diary is just like what you might imagine it is. They, for that period, they just follow themselves through the day and uh, write down, quote unquote, electronically mostly, uh, every place they went, how they got from one place to the next, uh, you know, in terms of mode and a, a host of other useful inf details of information concerning their travel. As Steve noted, uh, you know, the, the 2010 survey that, that we all, many of us participated in was, at the kind of at the tail end of the previous approach to doing travel surveys, you know, was in the rather early days of smartphones starting to become common. And uh, so the, that survey was conducted using essentially a telephone interview approach where we would literally mail people diaries. They would write stuff down in them, usually just using them as a memory jogging device. And then some of the survey staff would call them that evening or the next day 
and uh, interview them and take over take down over the phone into their own computer system the details of the diary that they had uh, had written down and or had in their heads or a little of both. So the the really exciting thing about this survey that we're uh, in the, the very beginning stages of is that we will uh, be using uh, smartphone applications uh, as widely as possible and that'll cover most of the respondents uh, to uh, assist with the recording of this diary information. <clears throat> so uh, without going into a lot of detail, basically the, the smartphone app takes a lot of the burden off the respondent so that it's a, a great deal less effort and work for them to uh, record and, and transmit the diary data to the, the database that the consultant will be uh, managing. So the, there are several virtues to that. One of the biggest ones uh, is that because that burden is less, we can get more data out of them. In past years, we really could only uh, get 24 hours worth of data out of people. If we ask them to do like 48 or even more hours of diary, people just stop participating. And uh, you know the, the quality of the data dropped off very rapidly after the first day. Since this is much easier for them to do and it's much more automatic, uh, the surveys that have been conducted to date using this type of technology have uh, had great success in multi-day, some of them even as much as seven days worth of data. So how many days precisely we're going to be pursuing is going to be one of those things that the oversight committee will be discussing here in the in the coming uh, weeks and months. But uh, it's a very exciting element of it. Uh, one of the things that's particularly attractive to me and is part of CDOT's particular interest in this, although I, I think most of the MPOs are interested as well, is that we almost certainly will be able to get weekend data uh, for the first time ever. Uh, in past surveys, we restricted ourselves to only gathering weekday data. I think we're all aware of how much more complicated and challenging the weekend uh, travel patterns and congestion are becoming, uh, both uh, in recreational corridors and in the metro areas. So I think this, this is going to be a, a really big step forward for a lot of us in gathering data to deal with some problems that are getting more and more severe as time goes on. The, the slide here lists a number of other categories of uh, uh, travel sort of markets within the MPOs and the state. Uh, and as you know, I think we're all quite aware, some of those are emerging, some of them are going from smaller to bigger. Uh, you know, some of them are become, become more important over time. You know, visitors is an interesting example where in, in my past years at Dr. Cog, there was a period when we didn't really think of ourselves in the metro area as much of a sort of a destination for tourists and visitors. Obviously, we're aware that that has changed a lot in the last you know, 10 to 15 years. So, uh, the, you know, several of the MPOs fall in that same category. So visitor data is really important. Obviously, it's important in other parts of the state as we're obviously a, a big recreational draw from around the country and the world. Uh, there are, you know, I'll skip over rental car use, which doesn't need a whole lot of elaboration. I think we're all obviously aware during the COVID period of all the chatter about uh, household package delivery increasing. So that's an area we're going to be uh, really heading toward. Uh, the uh, issues of various other modes that are emerging, micromobility, you know, the continued increase in bicycle and pedestrian, et cetera, are all things that we're all going to be discussing uh, and, and trying to prioritize in the project, recognizing, of course, that we could ask, the even with the, the easier burden of the smartphone app, we could find ourselves asking for respondents, you know, asking them to provide so much information that they would still get sick of us and think it was too much work and not want to participate. So we always have to balance, you know, of making sure, our, as they used to say, our eyes are not bigger than our stomach. So we'll be, we'll be working on all of that. Uh, one you know, other bullet just to emphasize here is the you know, quote unquote big data that we're all uh, quite familiar with these days. We will be, you know, given that such data continue to, to uh, change and morph or through time, we will be uh, also discussing that at length in the planning phase and throughout the project, I suspect, what kind of, of data of that sort we wanna purchase and fold into the product that we ultimately deliver. I will just note that uh, we will be using that type of data here at the beginning of the project. The consultant team already has some of it that's just 
you know, data that they use in-house uh, and have you know, contracts to obtain for their own use. We'll be using those data to track the, uh, the changes in travel behavior as we come out of, of the uh, COVID period. The goal being here that we will use such data to uh, identify when we've reached some sort of post-COVID stability. I'm probably stating the obvious you all when I say that we don't want to uh, do surveys of a period that then becomes obsolete, <laughs> you know, a year later or less when, you know, so we've, we've, we've got data on an ephemeral period that doesn't really help us very much with analysis and forecasting. So that's something we'll be tracking very carefully as we go through the planning phase of this project, trying to figure out when we can really start the sort of full blast survey. Next slide, please. <laughs> I think there's a next slide. I am attempting to. It's yeah. Yeah. not advancing. Hmm. There we go. Oh, there we go. And not too much. Yeah. So as Steve noted, you know, we we're going to be working on schedule on this, obviously as well. Uh, I think we're quite solid on 2021. We have the first task order under contract. We have notice to proceed to Westat, which is the prime uh, of the consultant team. And we are uh, scheduling the first oversight committee meeting for, I think, the first week of, of June. I have to go back and look at my, my horrible in email inbox and see how that's doing. And as, as it notes here, we'll be, we'll be working on what's the sample design, you know, so how do we select which people to interview. We'll be working on what's called the survey instrument in the biz, meaning basically the, the, uh, the diary itself, whether it be on the smartphone or other, uh, uh, other types of technology. And we'll be, you know, thinking in, in terms of response rates that have been experienced in other surveys to help us understand more about sort of average cost per household and how many households we will ultimately deliver. And then we'll be working on per particularly a pilot survey of the household travel diary. In my experience, you, it's, it's a very dangerous thing to go out into the field with a full scale survey without having done a pilot first especially if you happen to come up with some new questions. Uh, I've, I've found it to be a lot easier to confuse people when you ask them a question than us survey types ever imagined could be possible, partly because we wrote the question and thought about it for you know, weeks or months before we finalized the wording. So of course we understand what we mean, but uh, often the public will not understand it quite as well as we do. So uh, doing pilots is really crucial. Uh, in, my, my guess at this point is that we will start the fielding of the full survey sometime in 2022. Uh, I would like to imagine it's early in 2022, but we're basically going to let the, the tracking data guide us in what to do on that. We, you know, I, I shudder to think of, of gather, spending a lot of money, frankly, on data that becomes obsolete within you know, potentially even months. So that's something we're definitely not going to do. Um, There'll be a lot of work with you know, recruitment, which is a big effort. The, there's a large team of interviewers that will still be involved in this uh, because some people will not be able to or want to participate by a smartphone. So we'll be providing some other options for them. And then we'll be conducting the survey. My, my, my best guess at this point is that once we start the survey, it will take us about a calendar year to, uh, to fully execute. Uh, the household diary survey, the other pieces we'll be, we'll be thinking over and some of those will be in parallel and some of them will be in series with the larger household diary survey. And um, then, you know, the, the, just a note that I haven't mentioned the scale of the survey at this point with the participants we have and the funding we have, we're shooting for about 20,000 households around the state. So that's approximately 50,000 people. So it's a pretty big effort. Then at the end of, of one or more surveys, we'll go into QAQC mode. We'll be doing some of that during the survey, which uh, is a key uh, uh, capability in terms of getting uh, the best data. So if, if a respondent provides something that seems strange to us, we, if we still have them on the, on the hook, as it were, in the midst of the survey, we can just go back to them and ask them to clarify. And then we'll be doing what's called data expansion, which essentially means um, starting from the 20,000 households and sort of blowing it up so that it represents the full, what is it, uh, roughly 2 million households that there are in the state. And then we'll be preparing uh, reports. I, I forgot to touch on media and public outreach. 
uh, it is really important to do our best on that because it improves the response rate. If there are some subpopulations that uh, particularly tend not to respond at good rates, but that, who are really important to the, uh, the, our ability to fully represent Colorado uh, residents, we're going to want to be targeting those subpopulations, whether you know special radio stations or websites or what have you. So we're going to be working on all of that as well to make sure that we have uh, done a good job of, of, at the end of this, getting what they call a representative sample of, of uh, residents of Colorado. In 2010, there was a period, uh, that, during that period, uh, the uh, uh, immigration services were uh, particularly active and uh, this was creating a great deal of concern in the Hispanic community. Other cities that I was you know, chatting with at the time as we were planning the 2010 survey had, as a result, had abysmal response rates from Hispanic households. We took that to heart and did a lot of outreach in Spanish language radio and other forms of media and actually had a pretty good Hispanic household response rate. So we'll be examining similar issues. Uh, as we uh, plan the survey for Colorado. I think that's about all I have. I think the next slide is just thank you. Or does anyone have any questions? So, yes, yeah, so thanks, thanks, Eric. Um, I just wanted to point out one other thing is that I, there will be points in time, I'm sure, that we will be coming back to TAC uh, to the TAC committee um, at certain milestones during, during the survey. So stay tuned on that over the next next couple of years and I know we're a little short for time, but if there's any key uh, questions or of course contact either me or, or Eric uh, anytime after the meeting too, if you have any questions or yeah. suggestions. George, Steve, this can't, um, George has a question uh, from um, Denver International. Go ahead, George. I think you're still muted, George. I, I'm really sorry. That's the usual. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just want to thank Steve and Eric. This is super exciting stuff, and we look forward to kind of seeing the the you know outcomes of this survey. Just a quick question: Is on the location-based service data? Do you plan to maybe purchase like 2022 and 2023, or just 12 months worth of data? What what's your plan? So, uh, George, we don't have a final plan at this point. Uh, I hate to sound wishy-washy, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, I think you know the oversight committee is going to be discussing that. One of my one of my guiding thoughts about this, anyway, for whatever it's worth, is knowing that these data keep changing and updating. We're going to want to uh, make sure that we don't buy old data, in effect. You know, and so that's going to be a key question. Another related matter is going to be, to, to your point about 2022-23, we may well want to purchase some data that matches up in time with the other types of survey data that we obtain. So we have a, a self-consistent package. Uh, so, and then one thing I didn't note is that we are gonna be working on planning for some hope for follow-up surveys through the decade as we you know, when we started talking about this a couple of years ago, we expected this to be a very active decade with lots of changes, and so far it hasn't disappointed in that regard. So, uh, you know, we, we may find that we want to uh, do some smaller purchases of, of these types of data through the decade. So, sorry, as a wishy-washy answer, but we're definitely going to be talking about that in the planning. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, George. Thank you, uh, Steve and Eric, and we'll move on to our next item at this point. Um, the CDOT Mobility Hub Program and Project status, and uh, it's attachment G, and Emily Lindsay will uh, start us off there. So, Emily? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm excited to uh, present Sharon Terranova with CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail um, and a member of the project team, Ed Parks. They'll be talking to you about CDOT's Mobility Hub strategy and give a project status update for mobility hubs in the Denver region. So Sharon or Ed, you are welcome to share your screen now. Okay, thanks, Emily. I believe Ed's gonna share. Thanks, Ed. So I'll kick it off. And uh, so thanks for having us here at Dr. Cog's Tech. 
Uh, we're going to talk about our mobility hub program, which we've been developing uh, for just a couple years now since uh, since we got the Senate Bill 267 funding package. And uh, that's allowed us to build strategic transit facilities across the state. Next slide, please, Ed. So I'll start with our vision and our goals. And uh, the vision is that CDOT is going to re-envision the traditional park and ride. Um, you jumped ahead, Ed. Thanks. Uh, and, and create these mobility hubs. So, so these are transit um, transportation centers at select locations. Uh, you'll see that they're uh, spaced about 10 miles apart on I-25 and 30 miles apart on I-70. Uh, and we're emphasizing the multimodal connections and uh, providing seamless mode to mode transitions. This means that when you get off bus stang, there'll be a local bus waiting for you um, and vice versa. Um, so we, we would time the schedules with connecting transit. Uh, we're also providing real time passenger information such as next bus arriving in five minutes or service delay anticipate you know, an additional five minute wait and, and messages like that. Um, we're looking to make it convenient for our customers and also to create um, transit friendly communities around these, these transit hubs. Uh, we're working on um, working with developers to make sure that there's uh, access to local access to the, the uh, mobility hub via uh, at least if there's not housing there that people uh, hopefully can get there locally by walking or by transit. But we are looking to have uh, housing and uh, businesses locate uh, transit oriented development around the mobility hubs. Uh, the goals are to increase transit ridership and provide these multimodal uh, connections we're also looking to increase safety. Uh, we would increase the um, reliability. Um, it's actually decreasing travel time um, and uh, provide opportunities for economic vitality and make improvements to air quality by getting people out of their single occupant vehicles and onto the bus, obviously. Um, we're going to decrease the number of vehicle miles traveled um, by Colorado residents and also have positive impacts on pollution uh, across the state. And we're also uh, going to be decreasing congestion by taking a lot of vehicles off of the highways. Next slide, please. So um, what's a mobility hub, right? Uh, we have traditional park and rides, which is where you just like, like it sounds, you drive, you park, you get on a bus and, and that's it. Typically um, they have no local transit connecting to it um, and there's very limited amenities, maybe a, a shelter that has a bench, but that's about it. There are no um, programmable or uh, information displays. There's, there's no information provided, maybe, uh, maybe a paper map it, within the shelter. Uh, then there's the transit centers, and these are locally owned and operated transit facilities. Uh, Bustang would stop at them and often does, but they are, they are not CDOT owned or operated. They're, they're run by local agencies. Um, and on the right, you'll see an example of the future Colorado Springs Downtown Transit Center schematic. Uh, so that would be one where Bustang uh, serves it, but doesn't run it. And uh, Frisco is another example where we're contributing funds to that. And then the Pueblo Transit Center, same thing. So that's another type. Um, and then we get to our mobility hubs and these are the focal point in the transportation network um, that seamlessly integrate different types of transportation, whether it's, um, you know, we'll have uh, local buses, we'll have bus setting, um, we can have um, uh, van pools there, um, you know, a, bike rentals or bike shares. Uh, so, so we're just really trying to make that last uh, first and last mile connection uh, available for people. Also, uh, we wanna connect to employment and housing. Next slide, please. 
So here's the history of how we got to where we are today. And it started out with the inner city and regional bus network plan in 2008. And then in 2009, DTR was created. The Division of Transit and Rail was created by state legislation. Uh, the North I-25 FEIS for express bus service was completed in 2011. And in 2014, the inner city and regional bus network plan was updated. That led to Bustang, uh, in a regional express bus service starting in 2015. And then in 2018, we added our outrider regional, uh, rural regional network. And, and typically that those operate in the rural areas and feed into the Bustang uh, system. So we, we're building out the system across the state. Uh, in 2019, our first mobility hub was approved for construction uh, up in Loveland at Centera Loveland. On the right side, you can just see where we're spacing the um, mobility hubs. Like I said, on I-25, we're looking to locate them at 10 mile uh, distances so that we're not getting off at every exit and uh, we're able to, to keep buses running and cut down on, on uh, travel time for our commuters. Where possible, we're building them in the managed lanes in the center median station of I-25 so that the buses can stay in the managed lane, pick up people in the middle, avoid weaving across three lanes of traffic to outside to stop and pick people up. Um, we are reducing uh, conflicts of buses and vehicles by doing that too, so it's a safer alternative. Next slide, please. So this is the Mobility Hub program. And you can see this is I-25. They're dotted all along I-25 and they're at various stages of development. Uh, we've also got two on I-70 so far, um, but I'm going to just start at the bottom here on the right hand side, which is completed. We've got four completed and that's uh, Fort Collins Downtown Mobility Hub, Denver Union Station, Colorado Boulevard, and Pueblo Downtown Transit Center. Now, I'm not saying that we completed these as mobility hubs, but they, they function as mobility hubs and they are, they are already completed and we are serving them. Uh, as I move up under construction, we've got two on North I-25, one in, and they're both center median stations, one in Berthoud and uh, one in Loveland, as I said, at Centera. And then moving up further in, in planning and design in progress, We've got the Firestone Longmont Mobility Hub, Idaho Springs Mobility Hub, quite a few here in the, in the Dr. Cog area, uh, Lone Tree Mobility Hub, Castle Rock Mobility Hub, and then we've got two in, uh, in Region 2 in Colorado Springs. We've got the Downtown Transit Center, as I said, uh, we're building another mobility hub on I-25 in North Pueblo, and then we've got one uh, that they're doing planning for right now out in Grand Junction. And then as I move to the top there, planning and design not started, here's a bunch of projects that are either park and rides right now that will become mobility hubs, or they've been identified in uh, it through our planning process and we will be constructing there, but it might be in the five to 10 year pipeline of projects. But the project's been identified through the planning process. Next slide, please. So the, these are the projects, the mobility hubs within Dr. Cog area. And uh, we wanted to spend some time with you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time in our, for, in our presentation to, to go through all of the conceptual designs, actual designs, construction photos of these projects. But I mean, we wouldn't mind coming back and, and showing you those. Uh, so um, hopefully we can do that at a, at a meeting soon. Um, but I'll just give you the highlights here is Colorado 119 mobility hub. That's the Firestone Longmont uh, mobility hub. We used to call it the Firestone mobility hub. And then at the last region four Dr. Cog communities meeting, uh, the group really decided that since if you go east, it's Firestone. If you go west, depend, you know, it, it's Longmont. So we changed the name to the Firestone Longmont mobility hub. And right now we're in uh, phase one, we are, just about complete with our design for the interim location. So phase one is interim, phase two is center median. So something that's interim will have bus slip ramps and a park and ride. 
Uh, it won't have too much more than that. It'll have, you know, shelters and, and, and such, but it doesn't have the center median station. And we're hoping wherever possible, when we build managed lanes, that we would migrate to a center median station. Uh, so that's in design right now. We've got funding approved for that project. And uh, at the earliest, uh, it could be completed by summer of 2022. Um, that project uh, has... Uh, for interim, 275 parking spaces. We've got EV chargers. Anytime CDOT builds any parking, we are required to uh, build 5% of the parking spaces need to uh, be ready with EV chargers from day one, opening day. Uh, and then we pre-wire for another 20%. So um, we're following that mandate and uh, in all of the new mobility hubs we're designing, um, where we're building parking, we are including EV charging. Um, for also for Firestone, um, the center median station, uh, we have set aside three and a half million dollars for property acquisition because we need the south lot. I'll have to show you this next time on, on um, some overviews, but um, anyway, we set aside money for the south lot, which would allow us to move our park and ride south and uh, access the center median station there. So that's, that's been programmed. And we also, uh, I don't believe it's on here, we also went to the TC uh, last month, the Transportation Commission, and uh, asked for and received another $2 million for improvements, for access improvements. Um, so that's a, uh, we're providing a signalized intersection and an access road over that south lot when we get it so that cars coming out of the park and ride can actually make a safe left turn with a light. Right now they can't do that. And so that's a really, really good improvement for, for our customers. Um, let's see, um, we also have 30%, we're working toward 30% design of the center median station. Now, um, and I should mention on this one that we are looking for a raise grant for this project. Um, if, if we're able to get that raise grant, then what we would do would be to um, use the funds that we were gonna use to construct the interim configuration and go straight to the center median station with those federal funds. So, so that's what we are working toward. Hopefully we, we get it. If we don't, we still have our interim plan and then we'll build out the center median station when the managed lanes monies become available. Um, at State Highway 7, I-25 and State Highway 7, we are going to construct an interim uh, mobility hub there. And that again is bus slip ramps. That's a, a bike ped overpass and then a park and ride for uh, 180 cars. Uh, the total project cost you'll see there is $200 million, which is pretty big, but that's for the whole thing. That's for managed lanes, the um, the road, you know, State Highway 7 improvements, the center median station. So we just can't come up with that funding in this in this four year program. So we've approved $11.5 million for this project for the interim location. And we'll start out with 1.5 million in year three. Uh, we haven't had any design meetings on that yet, um, but we're beginning to have discussions on that now. The Lone Tree Mobility Hub is going very well. We're working with the city. Uh, we're working, uh, we just had a couple of stakeholder meetings with Dr. Cog was there, RTD, Douglas County, um, obviously the city of Lone Tree, and, and we're making some progress there in nailing down a location for the mobility hub and also uh, looking at a long-term plan. So we're starting out with probably just a, uh, a, bus, a bus platform um, bus stop on the southbound side on I-25, um, right next to the light rail station there in Sky Ridge. And uh, on the northbound, we'll probably still take Bustang off highway um, and directly to the light rail station until such time as on the east side, uh, construction begins on the development that they have planned there. So we're working on that right now. It's, it's really exciting. That's an interesting one because uh, the city does not want parking. So we're not building any parking there. Uh, everything is about multimodal connections. So it's, it's 
pretty exciting. Um, the, for that project, we have $10 million set aside. Um, for Castle Rock Mobility Hub, it's interesting. This is one of the earlier ones that we started working on, but it's not, it's not progressing as quickly. Um, right now, we're still waiting on, I think we're waiting on the approval from Douglas County for that development. Um, but we're, you know, we're really excited about it. We've got $15 million for that project. Uh, that should be about 288 parking spaces. Uh, we do have a developer. Uh, so, and that's close to 10 miles from the Sky Ridge station, keeping with our, our uh, ideal. And um, so that's in the planning stage right now. And then we're also working on the Idaho Springs Mobility Hub with the city of Idaho Springs. They're really leading the project, but we're about a 50-50 match on this one. Um, and we're planning on putting about 100 Bustang um, parking spaces there, but they're doing a deck. So they'll have probably up to 300 parking spaces there. Um, like I said, it's a joint joint project um, and it will be served by Bustang, um, Clear Creek County Transportation, Transit, the Prospector, um, Greyhound, and then we'll also bring our new service, the uh, Bustang Express will also stop there. So that's really exciting. Um, and these are the projects in the Dr. Cog area. Next slide, please. So we ran all of the projects. This was just part of the planning process. I mean, we ran all of the projects that came out of um, our bus network plan and also out of the statewide transit plan through these different um, criteria and you know, just making sure that we check the boxes on these projects as we brought them to the Transportation Commission for approval. Uh, so, um, you know, project readiness. How quickly can we get them out the door? We do have a timestamp on on this money. Um, Eighty-five percent of all the 267 funds need to be spent within three years. Um, so, you know, we're looking for opportunities to bundle. Um, with highway projects, we're looking for a partnership funding. Um, we're doing really well with partnership funding, um, both from localities, you know, municipalities and developers. So uh, it's, it's, it's really good to see that coming together. Um, we're also addressing the statewide transit plan goal areas. Um, we're looking at, as I said, strategic nature. Can we get grant funding? Um, we're, we're also making sure that all of the projects are documented in, in uh, planning documents. And uh, we're also making sure that we're serving activity centers, that, that we're providing uh, beneficial transit for, for people. And then we are, are looking at uh, envir environmental justice. Uh, we're looking at partner capital and we do evaluate when we choose the design, we're evaluating the operating cost. So this is the criteria. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand it off to Ed now. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so what we have here is our mobility hub planning process. So that kind of the next step from what Sharon was just talking about and how we identify the projects. Uh, and what you see on the top ribbon here is a mobility hub handbook that serves as our essentially our strategic uh, plan. When it outlines the vision for the CDOPS mobility hubs, the planning framework for developing the mobility hubs, and then the design guidelines and standards to support the quality design for the hubs. And then at that's that overall, so you know, I-25, I-70 sort of viewpoint of these hubs. And then at each station location, uh, we're gonna be doing a what we're calling a mobility hub area plan. So within that, we'll have the background information related to the plans and the projects, the existing additions that inform the physical network improvements. Uh, and then we'll also go from like that planning level into about a 10% design uh, effort we'll do the physical network improvements. So looking at the, the hub configuration, layout, the operational aspects, et cetera. And then as Sharon kind of alluded to before, we have uh, we could, some of these we may have, we're calling a phase one or an interim or a phase two and move to the center median. So we have a near-term recommendations and some of our long-term recommendations, depending if we need to phase the project. And then this is our, our criteria and metrics and how we uh, evaluate the hubs and their location. So what the handbook outlines is that there's a two step process. And some of you have like, as we talked about with Lone Tree, and some of you have been through this process with us. Um, so this is really how what we evaluated to 
look at where it would be in the next step. So whether it would be like Sky Ridge Station or if it would be at Lincoln, et cetera. So trying to figure out which station location would be best. So we looked at in terms of criteria, it would be the distance from nearby mobility hubs. So we're looking for that 10 mile spacing at I-25 and 30 mile spacing at I-70. Uh, we're looking at the transit operations, whether it can accommodate that center median transit stop, uh, looking for the efficient travel times, the ability used to manage lanes, how well it aligns to our vision and goals, uh, some of the site constraints, whether it's site accessibility and the right-of-way availability, uh, some of the topography and terrain obviously makes some impacts there in space available. Uh, we're looking at travel patterns, the, the you know, our daily traffic volumes, the existing transit ridership, the boardings and lighting, some of the projected transit ridership, and then connectivity. So we're looking at, we did a network analysis, looking at the miles of existing of planned sidewalk, bicycle facilities and trails, and then just making sure there's connections to local transit and maybe some future front range passenger rail. Um, and then as we go through that, we actually wanna build up that political and stakeholder support for, for that ideal location. And then we're also looking at development land use characteristics, whether existing adjacent supporting land uses, whether it's compatible with the local land use zoning and the ability to promote and implement TODs or planned supporting development is underway. And I believe some of you went through this as a Sky Ridge station. So this is just an example of what that all ends up kind of spitting out. Um, this is, is, I know it's a lot of information, uh, but basically you can see on the right there, some of the green is, you know, good and pink is, you know, okay and yellow is somewhat compatible etc so this is just to give you an example of what we're kind of doing there the second step is to determine uh the typology so we defined in the handbook we defined there's three different typologies uh and this helps determine our level investment at each uh hub so as you can see in the center uh column there we're looking at some of the contextual characteristics of the transit activity uh the land use characteristics and the population demographics uh, depending on how those that analysis and that scoring equals out to, you get a low, medium, or high. So a type one would be sort of like our what we're thinking a like Larkspur mobility hub would be in the future. Uh, Birth is a type two, and Satara Loveland uh, up north is a type three. Um, so that just kind of determines, like I said, the level of amenities and the level of investment we're doing there in terms of uh, amenities, and like that could be to go into it here. Uh, the scoring here could be you're looking at, you know, the multi regional connections, the connections of the state highway system. Uh, we're looking, we'd like to have some local regional transit connections, whether it's pedestrian facility connections, bicycle facility connections, park and ride. Uh, some of the station amenities, whether we have uh, route information, real time transit, universal ticketing, uh, the furniture, the shelter, canopy, the windscreens, et cetera. And then we kind of build up into some of the enhanced station amenities, whether restrooms, it could be a welcome center, artistic elements, um, we look at Wi-Fi, emergency call in boxes, and then just overall connectivity to other pieces. This is just uh, sort of an example of what could be laid out. This is a total fix fic fictional uh, area, but just giving you a standard diamond uh, interchange with some, you know, businesses around here. But in the bottom right hand corner, you have the, the inline station. Uh, you have your TOD opportunities, and then we're looking at some of the amenities like the public space, local regional transit connections, uh, you have the park and ride, uh, pedestrian bicycle facility connections, and then just how we could also lay this out. We have other, other things we'd have is like the route information, real-time transit information, furniture, uh, adequate lighting, security features, wayfinding information, really just trying to make it function as a place and have some connectivity along the interchange. Uh, then just based on typology and the approximate costs, um, just to give you some examples here. So the cost of mobility helps directly tied to the typology and they can vary. So you kind of saw that, which was Sharon was presenting earlier with the hubs in, in the Dr. Cog region. So we have center loading versus slip ramps and the parking demand. Those are some of the really key drivers. And then the cost of amenities such as fixtures, uh, the EV chargers, wayfinding signs, passenger information displays, et cetera. Those, the, the costs we show below uh, include those things. So project one, which is a large parking lot with 350 spots, uh, two slip ramps is similar to the Firestone Longmont. Uh, you're looking at nine to $18 million with a, an average of 13. Uh, a smaller parking lot with two slip ramps, so it kind of lowers it down to about that average 10 million or six and six million to 15 million. Uh, a small parking lot with off street bus bays, similar to what we're thinking might be in fair play at West. It would be three and a half to eight million with an average six. And then a large parking lot with center loading station. This is similar to Centera Loveland, 
this is around 16 million to 30 million with an average of 23. And then a location without parking, but slip ramps and pet connection. This is similar to Lone Tree as we were talking about before. The seven to 18 million, which is an average of 13. And then a downtown transit center with parking deck and off street bays could be come around 11, 16 million with an average of 14 million. We talk about some of the partnerships uh, and some of the costs. These uh, that Sharon's mentioned before, and some of the matching. What we're looking for is uh, these elements to be like our, our base cost level of what we're looking to do. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the key elements, as you can see at the top here, is this sort of ascending or descending uh, some of the high price items. You have the slip ramps, which we have, believe are like one to three million. Uh, the center loading station can be four to seven, so that's like the tunnel going underneath I-25 and building up that center station. The large parking lots, three to five million. The small parking lots, one to three million. Then you have your all-street bus bays, you go into 500 to one and a half million. Uh, the tunnel underpass is that two to five million dollar range. That's a big item there. And they're looking at shelters, uh, whether they're customer stock, and the large EV par large parking lot with EV charging. Their smaller parking lots. So these are just sort of the things we're we're looking at there and what their prices add up to. Hey Ed, this is this is Ron. I'm sorry to interrupt, and I know you've got a couple of slides left, but I'm I'm wondering if you could wrap up in about 30 seconds, just so there's at least a few minutes left before four for any questions or answers. Yeah, committee. So there's partnership funding. This kind of does your normal 80 20 or 50 50, depending on the mobility hub. Uh, we have some supporting planning documents and that kind of goes back to what we all like to do in terms of planning and like supports best planning practices. And then we've been, this connects to a TDM policy that CDOT's got uh, through the 6001 process for adjusting or building new interchanges and which is really showing like how these two connect from a policy and the infrastructure standpoint. Uh, I think that's it. That was about 30 seconds, right? Thank you, Ed. Are there any questions um, for CDOT on this? Uh, Mac, see your hand raised, go ahead. Thank you, Kent, uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, question for Sharon, with the continued growth and development in the I-70 East Corridor, uh, Arapaho, uh, Aurora, uh, Adams County, uh, particularly east of, uh, east of where Central 70 uh, currently winds down in the in the Tower Road uh, area, there a lot of a lot of development uh, serving and 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 evolving in the Aerotropolis area and further east, the Colorado Air and Spaceport um, uh, transport uh, and additional uh, development uh, in the Watkins as well as the Air Park area. Interested in where CDOT is in terms of of really bringing bus tang and outrider service in that corridor. Uh, to serve as a as an anchor to these um, to this effort in terms of mobility hubs, and in particular to the sixteen oh complementary the sixteen oh one process uh, because of the uh, uh, development of a, a de additional interchanges out there and portals of access to that. Sure. Uh, right now, that's not something that uh, I'm working on. We, we do, we have really fully built out the uh, Senate Bill 267 program with very, very little remaining funds. However, um, we're hopeful that we're going to have some new transportation funding um, beyond year four of Senate Bill 267. And uh, I'll have to work with uh, Mike Timlin and Kyle on, on that and see if there isn't anything already that in the planning process that's been identified that we can work toward. Uh, currently, we're not serving that area as you noted. So, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really have a good answer for that right now, but it's certainly something that as things develop, you know, we, we are hoping to, to cover the state, so. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, but uh, I, I think I speak for all the all the jurisdictions in the East I-70 corridor. We would uh, certainly uh, look forward to uh, uh, a deliberate and uh, productive conversation with CDOT to direct some resources uh, uh, in that area, particularly uh, uh, given the statewide significance of Aerotropolis corridor, uh, Colorado Air and Space, and and other developments uh, occurring. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll bring that back and discuss it in, at DTR. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Um, George, you had a question or comment? Yeah, just a quick question for CEDA. Like when you're planning and designing mobility hubs along this uh, route, uh, rapid bus route, do you uh, factor in the potential that these buses might turn electric in the future? So you have some kind of ability to protect for some charging facilities for buses? So right now, um, we, we did meet at the for the Santero Loveland project uh, to discuss uh, in-station bus tank charging. Right now, we we don't have a bus that an electric bus that does that, but I know that the bus tank operations group is looking at electric vehicles certainly for the future. Um, we're probably ordering through the Senate Bill 267 program, we are ordering uh, some more of our traditional over the road coaches right now, but certainly the, the entire state, we have an eye toward electric vehicles. So um, it's not just the in-station charging or the vehicles though, it's, you know, it's the, the infrastructure that's required to, um, to you know, uh, on the end, uh, end of line also for maintenance and, um, you know, if we need to charge in one location versus in line station. So, I mean, I'm not the person responsible for that. However, I, you know, we are having discussions about that now. And certainly, um, like I said, with, with the future of, of the importance of electric vehicles and really, uh, especially in Colorado, we really focused on that now. Thank you. Thank you, George. Sarah, you had a question or comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to say that I appreciate uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog bringing this presentation to us today and the work that's being done to better define mobility hubs and develop this uh, mobility handbook. Um, I know we, um, I'll try to make my comments quick here. Um, so with the, I really appreciate the work to noting that the Colorado 7 I-25 um, interim is, is moving ahead and I'm really looking forward to that partnership with that project. And um, as far as the mobility handbook, um, I'm curious if, uh, if CDOT will be looking for local input on some of those metrics that may not be fully apparent to the CDOT staff, um, especially in areas that are currently under major development. Um, and if there's an opportunity to uh, provide input to the mobility hub. I'm sorry, the mobility hub handbook. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, it's been some time. Uh, yeah, certainly we're, we'd be happy to meet with you about that or if you wanna send comments in, absolutely. Right now we're, you know, we are looking at just the Bustang mobility hubs, but um, yeah, the, I, the, the State Highway 7 really just came, moved, advanced into the program. So we would love your input for sure. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we'd be happy to help provide some input to that. And um, I have another question about the design. So the design that I've seen here in the presentation and in the, mo the draft mobility handbook um, doesn't quite fit the concepts that we've developed with CDOT. And um, we worked about five years ago to developing a concept. So I'm curious if other design concepts will be considered for mobility hubs or if the concept shown here actually that's on the, the slide shown is kind of the, the way that CDOT is moving ahead. So they're really, um, they're, we don't have one design, Sarah. Uh, it is really based on the location. So like I said, you know, when we were talking about Sky Ridge, it's completely different than any of the other ones. And even, uh, you know, at, at each location, North Pueblo is different. And, and you know, it just worked out for Sentara, uh, Loveland, and for Bertha that they're, they're very, they're similar and that they're center median stations, but they're also different. There's a different design for each of them. So it, it is based upon the location. We haven't gotten into design for the, certainly the State Highway 7, and we would work with local communities on as we go through the design. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sharon. Appreciate that. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, not seeing any additional questions. Thank you, Sharon and Ed, for your presentation. And uh, we'll move on to our next item. Uh, there's an informational item in your packet. 
I'll just refer you to that to read unless Ron just really wants to speak to it. And uh, with that, uh, Carson, if you could give a brief update on the AMP working group. Uh, sure, Mr. Chair, I'll keep it very, very short. Uh, the AMP working group met earlier this month uh, and heard some updates regarding the work of the system operations focus area, essentially a subcommittee of the group and participated in an in-depth parallel interactive minty meter polling exercise throughout that meeting. Regarding that work, uh, RTD gave a presentation uh, focused on the transit priority is in the Denver region coming out of the pandemic. And there was an open discussion about the entire region's future of work as we kind of all grapple with how people are gonna return to work in the coming months. That's all I have, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Carson. Are there any other member comments or other matters to bring before uh, the, the TAC today? If so, please raise your hand. Cam, I see you've raised your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just speaking on behalf of Alvin Bedell Sanchez, who had to had to leave. Uh, I will be sending out a Title VI survey. Uh, it's voluntary and anonymous, um, and I'm sending it to the TAC members specifically, and I will be sending it uh, after this meeting. It's completely voluntary, uh, but we would encourage you to please fill it out. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Are there any other items? Seeing none, um, our next meeting is June 28th, uh, next month. And with that, I uh, believe we should adjourn for the day. Thank you very much for your patience. Goodbye. Okay. Next month's meeting will not be this long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.